Welcome to the review for exam four for Math 1210 Calculus 1 for students at Southern Utah University. As usual, I'll be your professor today, Dr. Andrew Misseldine. Now, if you're watching this video, you've probably participated in the previous exams for this lecture, uh, for this course. Uh, therefore, you're probably familiar with the basic policies, rules, procedures, format of this exam. So I'm not going to go into all the details about that. If you do have questions about that, I would suggest consult the course syllabus, the announcements and policies on Canvas, or just reach out to your instructor. But again, many of us are probably familiar with that. Uh, exam four uh, is going to be covering lectures 31 through 41 in our lecture series. So this will include the topics of extreme values, both absolute extrema and local extrema, the mean value theorem, the first and second derivatives test, uh, L'Hopital's rule, uh, the, the idea of curve sketching using derivatives to sketch a curve, solving optimization problems, uh, approximating values using linearization and Newton's method, and an introductory topic on antiderivatives. That is, can we compute a few basic antiderivatives? This test will include 15 questions. Uh, the first 10 questions will be about the mul will be multiple choice questions for which you'll get five points each for those. Uh, questions 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15 will be in the free response section. Their points do vary on the low side. Uh, question 11 is worth seven points. On the high side, question 15 is, on th is worth 13 points. Each question will be approximately uh, 10 points in value, again, on, on average. And then also there will be two points for turning in uh, the, your approved notes at the end of this exam. In terms of when or where you'll take this exam, and like I said, other semester to semester policies, rules about the exam, please con contact the course syllabus to find that information. In this video, I want to review the basics of the types of questions that you should be preparing for before you take the exam. This is based upon, of course, the practice exam that's available to students. You can find it also in the link to this page. All right, so if we go through the questions in the order they're presented, question number one will give you a question about critical numbers. So remember what a critical number is. A critical number is a number in the domain of the function that makes the derivative equal to zero, or it makes the derivative undefined. So what are those values? Again, what are those values that make the derivative undefined or the derivative equal to zero? So these are what we call critical numbers. Critical numbers are important for optimization, uh, they're important about monotonicity and concavity. And so at the beginning of this unit, we introduce the idea of critical numbers. So if you want uh, if you want some practice on how to compute critical numbers or just the definitions, please consult the first lecture in this unit. Go back to lecture 31. Uh, basically, it's going to have you calculate a derivative. So the derivative rules that you know about already, the power rule, the product rule, quotient rule, chain rule, all of those derivative rules from our third unit are very much applicable in this section, in this chapter, uh, in this test, I should say. Feel free to use those. You have to do a derivative calculation, but then apply it to find these critical numbers. Question number two, you'll be asked to compute a limit, but this limit should be a fairly easy application of L'Hopital's rule. You'll notice, for example, with this limit, take the limit as x approaches zero of e to the x minus one over x. If you were just to plug in x equals zero, you'll get e to the zero minus one over zero, which e to the zero, of course, is equal to one. You get one minus one over zero. This looks like zero over zero. So this is a type of function uh, a limit for what I should say that L'Hopital's rule applies. So remember that when you have an indeterminate form of, of the form zero over zero or infinity over infinity, then L'Hopital's rule tells us that the limit as x approaches a, where a could be a finite number like zero, positive or negative, um, it could also be infinite plus or minus infinity, we see that the limit of f of x over g of x will be the same as the limit as x approaches a of f prime of x over g prime of x. So apply L'Hopital's rule to help you out with the calculation like number two. Question number three uh, will be a question that involves your knowledge of the first derivative test. Uh, before we go on, I should mention that L'Hopital's rule, at least the easier questions, were introduced in section 34. Uh, about half of that lecture was about L'Hopital's rule. The other half was about the second derivative test. Uh, L'Hopital's rule was also covered in lecture 35 as well. So consult those ones if you want more practice with L'Hopital's rule. 
Uh, returning to question number three, like I said, question number three will be some usage of the first derivative test. Which remember what the first derivative test is telling us. The first derivative test tells us that if we have some critical number, right, and we know that the derivative goes from a positive to a negative, well, if the derivative is positive, that means the function's increasing. And if the derivative is negative, that means the function's decreasing. So we're seeing something like this. Oh, if the first derivative switches from positive to negative, that indicate we have a local maximum on the graph. On the other hand, let's say we have our critical number again, but we see some other effects. Let's say the derivative goes from negative to positive at that critical number. That means the function would switch from decreasing to increasing for which the graph would have to look something like this. Oh, this indicates we have a local minimum. This is what the first derivative test is all about. Um, also, like again, like I said, when the derivative is negative, the function's decreasing. When the derivative is positive, the function's increasing. So this function right here is given to us as a polynomial function. Find the intervals for which f is decreasing. So what you would wanna do is calculate the derivative of f and identify, probably via sign chart, where is the derivative negative? If you're looking for the where the function was increasing, we would calculate the derivative and figure out where it's positive. You might be asked to identify maxima or minima. Use the first derivative test uh, to help you out on a question like number three. I'm gonna erase some of this so we can see the next question. Uh, but before we go on, let me do remind you that the first derivative test was introduced in our lecture series in lecture 33. Please consult that lecture, the notes, the videos, and the accompanying homework if you need some more practice, the sections of the book for more practice on that. Question number four will ask you to compute an antiderivative. So antiderivatives are the very last unit we talked about uh, excuse me, the last section we talked about in this unit. So antiderivatives were talked about in lecture 41. Uh, so we're looking for a function whose derivative is given. So do we, can we find a function whose derivative is cosecant cotangent? Can we find a function whose derivative is two times e to the two theta, where we also have some addition here. So look at the antiderivative rules that we've learned about in lecture 41. So there is a antiderivative version of the power rule, the sum rule, the difference rule, things like that. Um, every, every derivative formula we know can be reversed into an antiderivative formula as well. These will be very, very basic. We will talk some more about antiderivatives in unit five of our course, and also in calculus two, you talk so much more about antiderivatives. So this is just a very elementary, just a very basic antiderivative calculation. Don't forget the plus C, right? Uh, because again, we're looking for the most general antiderivative. Maybe you think the answer is the first one listed, cosecant theta plus e to the two theta. That, that maybe that's good. Maybe this is this is an antiderivative of such a function. I'm not saying it is, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But what I can tell you is that choice A has to be wrong because it's not the most general. Uh, the difference between say A and D, oh, excuse me, that's cotangent. A and, um, is it on there? I don't see it anywhere. So, well, apparently A is wrong uh, for other reasons. But if you were to compare, for example, uh, F and C right here. Those are the same except for that C is missing that plus C. So this is this is a antiderivative maybe of R, but it's not the most general. We want the family of antiderivatives. So don't forget your plus C. I've seen many students who've written on a note card, remember the plus C, do whatever you need to, to help you remember that, but that's going to be a big deal. On this one, as it's multiple choice, you can see the plus C's. Hopefully that'll be enough of a Q, uh, but you do need to know, uh, you do need to know that the plus C in order to get full credit on this one right here. Uh, so moving on, the last question on the first page here is question number five, which is gonna be about Newton's method. Newton's method we talked about in lecture 40 in our series. Uh, lecture 40 also talked about linearization, which we won't need that on this question. This question is gonna be a question about Newton's method, for which basically what you need to know about Newton's method is the formula for Newton's method. So you need to know that you have this sequence of numbers that converges towards the value you're trying to approximate, that the term xn plus one is equal to xn minus f of xn over f prime of xn. So in particular, if you're given x1 and you're given the function f, you hopefully should be able to find x2 because x2 will equal x1 minus the function evaluated at x1 divided by the derivative evaluated at x1. 
And typically for this type of question, uh, like we saw in the lecture, like we saw in the homework, you really should use computer approximations, a computer algorithm to help you with this because these calculations can get very tedious very quickly. Uh, but for this test, you won't have access to computer software or a graphing calculator. You'll have access to just a scientific calculator or less. Um, and so I, I do like to ask questions about Newton's method, but it's going to just be one iteration. So if I give you x1 in the function, can you cal calculate x2? If you can calculate x2 from x1, then ideally you could calculate any value in this sequence. Um, but again, to avoid tedious calculations, I don't need you to calculate x10. x2 will be sufficient. So you do need to know Newton's formula. So put that on your formula sheet. Uh, moving on to the next page. Question number six, this will be a baby optimization type question. So like this one, we're asked to find the minimum perimeter of a rectangle with an area of two of 100 centimeters squared. So the fact that you see that there's a minimum perimeter, that's an optimization type problem. Uh, no doubt about that. Just as a reminder, optimization questions we talked about in lectures 38 and 39 in our lecture series. So look at some of the examples you, you can see from those ones right there. Uh, we had many examples that had to do with geometry of some kind. So you should know, uh, either by memory or put them on your note card, you should know basic formulas of perimeter and area of two-dimensional figures. So that'll include rectangles, uh, triangles, circles, other types of polygons. Uh, I'm not necessarily going to pull out the most exotic things at all, but you should definitely know things like the Pythagorean equation, some of these basic two-dimensional formulas. Uh, you will also see an optimization question, the free response. This one gets on the easier side, fairly straightforward, fairly routine, uh, not very exotic compared to what you might see later on. But do be prepared. There will be two optimization questions on this test, one in the free response, one in the multiple choice section. Uh, uh, multiple choice section, that's right. Uh, so question number seven, this is going to be a question about the second derivative test. Uh, we had a question earlier about the first derivative test. This one's the second derivative test. Now I want to, well, one, first remind you that the second derivative test was introduced in lecture 34. So consult the lecture notes, the lecture videos, um, your own notes, homework, textbooks for more examples uh, for that. But question uh, seven, much like we saw earlier on the previous page with question number three about the first derivative test, this, it is intended to use the second derivative test, but hey, wait a second. How am I gonna know that necessarily as this is a multiple choice question? Well, one way to know that is because if I ask you a question about concavity, that has to do with the second derivative. Remember that if your second derivative is positive, that means that your function is gonna be concave upward. And if your second derivative is negative, that means your original function will be concave downward. And whenever you get a sign change of the second derivative, it switches from positive to negative or vice versa. If you ever see a sign change, that, that implies you have some type of point of inflection. All right, what makes the second derivative equal to zero um, or undefined gives us these potential points of inflection. So you might be asked questions like that. You also might be told things like the following. Um, let's say that our function, let's say, let's look at a variable. Let's say that f prime of say zero is equal to zero and f double prime of zero is equal to negative one. What can we say about the Point. Well, since f prime of zero is zero, that means it's a critical number, so it could be an extremum. Uh, but then the, it's negative, the function's concave down at that situation. If you're concave down at a critical number, oh, that means you are a local maximum. So you could say that x equals zero is a maximum, even if you don't know what the function is. Maybe the function's not given to you, you're just told that the first derivative is zero and the second derivative is negative one. But let me give you a variation of that. What if we tell you that the first derivative at zero is equal to two, and that the second derivative at zero is equal to, say, negative two. Well, the function's increasing because the derivative's two. The function is concave downward because the second derivative is equal to negative two. Is it a maximum? The answer is nope. Is it a minimum? The answer is nope. The thing is, the fact that it's not a critical number, we know that it can't be an extremum. So we could say something like that. Um, but what if we t what if we did one other variation you know, what if the derivative was equal to zero, so it's a critical number, but then what if the second derivative was also equal to zero? Then it's like, oh, uh, no decision can be made because uh, the second derivative is inconclusive in that situation. So be aware that on this question, number seven, also on number three, 
with the first derivative test, you might not actually be given a function to calculate the derivative of, or in this case, the second derivative. You might just be given information about the derivatives, and then you're supposed to infer information at extremum or concavity, monotonicity from that information. So you do need to know the first and second derivative test. They are slightly different, and you will be asked questions requiring the use of one or the other. So you need to be prepared to do both. Question number eight. It's going to be a question about linearization. Uh, remember, the linearization is just a code word for the tangent line. That is the tangent line approximation. For what you'll remember from our lecture series that the linearization L of X, well, basically, it's just the tangent line. You take Y minus F of A is equal to F prime at A times X minus A. And then you solve for Y, and so you end up with F prime of A times X minus A plus F of A where this is the x-coordinate of the point of tangency, this is the y-coordinate of the point of tangency, and this is the slope of the tangent line at the point of tangency, so the linearization. What we've seen is that if x is approximately a, that implies that L of x will be approximately f of x, uh, where there's some epsilon delta stuff going on there, but we don't have to worry about that. Just if x is close to a, then we can infer that L of x will be close to f of x. That's great. So you have to use the linear approximation here. Now, let me be warned, or let me warn you, I should say, that if you're asked to approximate something like the square root of 65, I'm aware that you have a scientific calculator. Could you plug that into uh, your calculator? Well, your calculator is probably going to give you a decimal expansion because it's an irrational number. And so if you're like, hmm, I'm going to work this thing backwards, I'm going to take answer F, maybe because when you plug that in, uh, that gives you the decimal expansion that's closest to what your calculator says, the square root of 65. I'll tell you right now, that's a trap. And the fact that you're watching this video means you're trying to avoid such traps, right? The thing is the linearization is an approximation technique, but your scientific calculator is gonna use things more sophisticated than the linearization technique. Probably something like Newton's method or something better than Newton's method is what your calculator is gonna be using. And therefore, the best answer, that is the answer the, that's the closest to the square root of 65 is not what the linearization will give you. And then Therefore, you can get the wrong answer if you don't use the linearization technique. So you now have been warned. The answer is not about the approximation. The answer is about the technique. And so using a different technique might give you, again, a more a better approximation, but not the approximation linearization gives you. Uh, so, so again, you've been warned here. Question number nine is going to be another question about L'Hopital's rule. Uh, this one is going to be on, I'd say, the harder side compared to what we saw in question number two. Uh, I realized I forgot to mention that linearization showed up in lecture 40. Uh, I told you part of the lecture 40 was about linearization. Part, most of it was about Newton's method. So go back to lecture 40 if you need some more practice on linearization. All right. Uh, L'Hopital's rule, remember, was explained in lectures 34 and 35. The harder ones, of course, were found in lecture 35. And so that's what you should expect right here on question number nine. Question number nine, for example, it, if you just plug in x equals pi, you're going to end up with pi from the left minus pi. And then you're going to get times by cosecant, excuse me, cosecant of pi from the left. For which, if you take pi from minus pi, that's going to give you zero. It is a little bit smaller than zero, right? So you get zero minus. And then for the for cosecant, you're going to get some type of vertical asymptote. Notice that pi makes cosine go to zero. Uh, excuse me, it makes sine go to zero because cosecant is one over sine. Uh, so it makes, so cos, uh, pi goes to zero, excuse me, sine goes to zero at pi, which makes cosecant undefined. Basically, you're going to get some type of plus or minus infinity. Um, we could actually figure out what exactly it is. Is it positive infinity or negative infinity? Uh, because we're approaching pi from the left, but I don't want to tell you that because that actually it doesn't matter in this situation. This is since you get since you have this like zero times infinity form, because uh, whether it's plus or minus infinity, the sign doesn't matter. This is something you need to use L'Hopital's rule for, but this is not L'Hopital directly. L'Hopital directly applies to zero over zero infinity over infinity. Because this is zero times infinity, you have to modify. You have to switch from zero times infinity to one of these forms. Uh, somehow, and that's what was talked about in lecture 35. So look at those examples and those appropriate homework questions if you need some more practice on that. Uh, we now arrive at the last question in the multiple choice section, question number 10. This is a question which you will be given a graph of the derivative. This is a very important thing. There's not going to be variation here. You will be given the graph of the derivative, not the graph of 
f, the graph of f prime. So when you see this function right here, this is the graph of f prime. But then you're asked, where is f increasing? And this is where you have to remember that f increases exactly where, excuse me, f is, f is increasing exactly where the first derivative is positive. So you're looking not for where the function's increasing because, excuse me, you're not looking for where the derivative's increasing. So this is a red herring, right? You're like, oh, the derivative's increasing here and it's increasing here. And so you might be tempted to say something like negative infinity to zero, union zero to two. Uh-uh, wrongo, this is not the right answer. This is where the derivative is increasing. Where is the function increasing? The function will be increasing when the derivative is positive. And likewise, the function is decreasing when the derivative is, the first derivative, excuse me, is negative. Um, I could also ask you, where is f concave upward, right? Uh, if the function, if the function's concave upward, that means the second derivative is positive. But if the second derivative is positive, that means the function f is, f prime, excuse me, the function f prime is increasing. So this, this right here, this interval, which we had earlier with c, this is where f is concave upward. This is not where f is increasing. So be careful about that. You'll be, you will be given the, the graph of f prime. What information about f can we infer from the graph? of f prime. Now this is stuff we've been talking about through the entirety of this fourth unit. In particular, uh, emphasis should be placed on lectures 33 about the first derivative test, 34 about the second derivative test. I would also include lectures uh, 36 and 37 about curve sketching and also the very first section about 31. Because uh, again, this whole unit is about how does information about the derivative affect the function. And so in particular, we saw questions like this for from lectures 34 and 33. So let's move on to the free response section. What type of questions are we going to see here? So question number 11, it's worth seven points. You will be given a so-called extreme value problem. Extreme value problem. These were problems. This was like the predominant problem we saw in lecture 31. Remember the extreme value theorem told us that if we have a continuous function on a closed interval, which is exactly what we have right here, then that function has a absolute maximum and an absolute minimum. So you need to identify what the absolute extrema for this function, what, what these extrema are, because they will be provided. Uh, that is, they will exist and you need to find it. That question's worth seven points. Uh, the second free response question on this page, question number 12, it'll be worth eight points. And on this question, you're going to see a question about antiderivatives, but in the context of science of some kind. So notice in this question, you're given the velocity function of, in this case, a falling ball. You're given the initial height of it, and then you're asked to see how high it is later on. So you're, at, you're asked, what is S of 10, right? Well, the, the idea to take care of here is that S of S of t, for example, is the integral, it's the antiderivative of v of t, right? So you have to calculate the antiderivative to find the general uh, antiderivative. Then you use the initial value to find this particular antiderivative that applies to the situation right here. So these were some of the story problems that we saw at the end of this unit, in particular lecture 41 was about antiderivatives. So be prepared to answer some type of story problem, basically a scientific application, a scientific interpretation of these antiderivatives. So you're given, you'll be given the function's derivative. You need to figure out what the original function is and answer questions about that. So we have to calculate the antiderivative velocity to get position. Um, a similar question is I could give you marginal cost so that you can say something about cost using the relationship of antiderivatives. Question number 13 will be a question about the mean value theorem, okay? So the mean value theorem was given to us really early on in our unit. Uh, it was lecture 32, which the mean value theorem says that if we have some function, right, if it's sufficiently continuous and sufficiently uh, differentiable, I'll let you look up the exact assumptions necessary, then, the, then if you have two points, right, so here's our point x equals a, and x equals b, then there's that there, you take the secant line between those, that somewhere between there between a and b, there will be a tangent line that is parallel to them. So uh, some interpretations 
of the mean value theorem. So question number 13 is a conceptual type question um, which asks you to use the mean value theorem, again, in some conceptual situation. This function right here, uh, it gives you a specific function um, you're supposed to explain why the hypotheses of the mean value theorem are satisfied on the interval uh, zero to one. And therefore the mean value theorem guarantees the existence of such a point. You're supposed to find where is that point or explain why it doesn't exist if it doesn't apply. Uh, some other variants we saw, like th think of the homework for lecture for homework 32. Another question we could see something like, oh, prove that this equation has at most one solution. That was another application of the mean value theorem. So question number 13 will ask you to do something similar to the homework uh, for lecture 32, homework 32. Uh, question number 14 will be that, will be the second optimization question that I promised you earlier. Uh, optimization, just as a reminder, occurred in lecture 38 and 39. This one will be on the harder side, maybe like three-dimensional questions will be involved. I do not expect everyone to have these various three-dimensional formulas memorized. Like this one has to do, let's see, what are we trying to do here? We're trying to minimize the cost of some type of can, some which is a cylinder basically, uh, that has a constraint on volume. Well, you are provided the volume of the cylinder, okay? So you don't need to have that memorized. So things like volume of a cone, pyramid, cylinder, even a sphere, I'm not gonna expect you to know all those things. The volume of like a rectangular prism, length times width times height, I don't think that's unreasonable. You should know that one. Uh, but you'll be provided these three dimensional formulas if they're there. This one will be harder than what you saw in the multiple choice because again, I intend for you to show your work. So go through the steps of an optimization problem. Tell me what is the constraint? What is the optimizing, func uh, the optimizing function? Give me the derivative of the optimizing function. Uh, plug in the constraint. Find the critical numbers. There's a lot to be shown here. This question's worth 10 points. We now arrive upon the final question on this exam, question number 15. It is worth the most, 13 points. This will be a curve sketching problem. You'll be given a function, the algebraic formula for that function, and you'll be expected to graph it right here on these grid lines. But there are a lot of steps you need to show to get full credit. So you need to mention to me, what is the domain of this function? What makes this function defined? What makes it undefined? What are the intercepts, both x or y intercepts? Check for symmetry. So if you take f of negative x, do you get negative f of x? So it's an odd function. Do you get f of x? So it's an even function. Or do you get something else? So it's neither. Do check for symmetry. Uh, there's points worth there. Uh, mention any discontinuities if the function has any. Uh, does the function have a remove point? Does it have a vertical asymptote? Does it have a jump discontinuity? I want to see the end behavior of the function. Uh, what's the limit as x approaches infinity? What's the limit as x approaches negative infinity? Does it have a horizontal asymptote? Does it have an oblique asymptote? Um, maybe the function's domain is restricted, like the natural log, in which case you take the limit as x approaches infinity and as x approaches zero from the right. Um, do so appropriately. Now, for your sake and also my sake as the grader here, uh, you will be given the first derivative. It's going to be computed and factored. So hopefully, since most of the legwork has been taken away from you now, you can then use the first derivative to set up a sign chart, like here are my critical numbers, do, 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 and it goes positive, negative, positive, ne negative, positive. This is our first derivative. So what does it say about the functions? Like, oh, it's increasing, it's decreasing, it's decreasing. Maybe there's some discontinuity there. Uh, maybe it's increasing, what have you. So fill out this sign chart and tell me the intervals where the function's increasing, decreasing, mention any local extrema if there are any. The same thing will also happen for the second derivative, tests for concavity. You will be given the computed factored second derivative, right? So you don't actually have to compute derivatives on this question. You have to interpret the derivatives uh, that's given to you. So again, build a sign chart, determine where the function concave up, where the where the function's concave down, identify any points of inflection. And so you, these are all the parts where you show your work. Then I wanna see all of this stuff come together into this picture. Uh, the domain needs to be what the picture, uh, the picture of the domain should be what you calculate. All of the x-intercepts should be represented here. The symmetry, discontinuity should be listed here. Um, the end behavior, 
the concavity, the monotonicity, all of that stuff should be listed in this graph. And that's why this question's worth so many points. There are a lot of pieces going on here. Uh, as a reminder, the lectures about curve sketching were lectures 36, oh boy, 36 and 37. So please look at the examples and homework for that to better prepare yourself for this test. So that then concludes our review for exam number four. We've talked about all the different question types. Clearly specific functions um, that you see right here could change, very likely will change, but the format of these questions will be very similar to what you saw in this review. If you do have any other questions uh, beyond what we've talked about in this video, please reach out to me, your instructor, um, either by email, come by face, uh, come by office hours, ask me a question in class, post a question on the discussion board, or whatever other format is most comfortable to you. Um, I'm, I'm here to answer any questions you have. Uh, so please, please let me know if you have any questions. And I will hopefully see you next time as we continue our study of calculus. Bye, everyone.